Howdy folks, hope you all had a good weekend, and welcome to another episode of Mingles with Jingles. A few things I wanted to get out of the way before I got on to the meat and bones of today's episode. I got an email from the Tank Museum a couple of days ago, letting me know that their online shop is now taking pre-orders for model TOGS. <laughs> yes! Uh, they're Kobe models, by the way, if you're not familiar with Kobe, they're sort of a competitor to LEGO. Um, and they have produced a whole series of different tank and ship models, uh, which both World of Tanks and World of Warships have been very happy to promote. But, well, now they're doing a TOG, and I think that's great. So I thought I'd let you know, you can pre-order them at the Tank Museum's online shop. Next up, you may recall a couple of months ago I invested in a new PC when I decided that I was going to start uploading and processing videos in HD, 2K and 4K resolutions. It was a good PC. I got it from a company called PC Specialist and I've gotten a lot of PCs from them in the past. This one developed a problem. The, uh, the CPU water cooler broke down and the PC started overheating so I had to send it back. I sent it back on the 19th of November last year. Now, they have a one-week turnaround on their returns, although, to be completely fair, it was right before Christmas, and the PC hardware situation in 2020, and even now in 2021, has been difficult. Uh, stocks have been low, particularly of GPUs and CPUs, although not of CPU water coolers. Um, so, providing there hadn't been any actual damage to the CPU, I wasn't expecting it to take too long for them to get the problem fixed and returned. Nevertheless, their website did warn me that they were experiencing particularly heavy loads at the time, and there was a fairly good chance that it might take as much as two weeks before I could get the PC fixed and returned. Now, I know all of the PC hardware snobs right now are turning their nose up and saying, Jingles, you really should just build it yourself. Well, yeah, that's great if you know how to do it. Um, and that's why people pay a premium, to have a system integrator build a PC for them, because it gives them the peace of mind that it's going to be put together properly, you hope. <laughs> that's not always the case. Uh, I've seen some horror stories on Linus Tech Tips and Jay's Two Cents and Hardware Unboxed, but most of the time the PC is going to be put together properly, and if anything does go wrong, you don't need to know how to fix it because it's covered. You do pay more to get a PC put together by a system integrator rather than just buying the components and building it yourself, but what you pay more for is peace of mind, because not everybody knows how to build a PC or troubleshoot problems or fix them. Nevertheless, bearing in mind that this was happening right before Christmas and given the current PC hardware situation, there was no way I could do without a PC for even the maximum of one week and the probable two or even three weeks that it might take for them to fix my PC, so I had to go out and buy another PC, which I did from a separate company, this company on Novatech. I've also bought PCs from them in the past and they are very, very good. As it turns out, the uh, new PC, which was supposed to just be a backup PC to see me through the time it was going to take to get the main PC repaired, turned out to be, in many ways, quite a bit better uh, than the main PC. For one thing, it had a, an RTX 3080 graphics card and one of the new generation of AMD CPUs. It didn't have as much memory, and memory is important when you're doing a lot of video processing, and I'm, I do a lot of video processing only came with 16 gigabytes, but it was the very latest 3600 megahertz memory. So I thought, ah, eh, simple enough problem, I'll just order another two memory sticks and double it up, because I did have four memory slots and I was only using two. Unfortunately, that's when my next problem, <laughs> I really, I've had no luck with hardware over the last couple of months because I spent about £100 uh, getting another 16 gigabytes of DDR4 3600 megahertz RAM um, and when I slotted it into the two spare memory channels the backup PC stopped working. Huh. So I took it out and I put it in again and it turned out that I just hadn't inserted the two new memory slots <laughs> correctly. <laughs> and I thought, hey, problem solved. Uh, Windows booted up I took a quick look, yep, 32 gigabytes of RAM, bargain. 
and then it crashed. So I restarted it. And this time it wouldn't even load Windows. Oh, for God's sake. I don't know what had happened. I mean, I've had just had no luck whatsoever with hardware. It turns out that after sending the memory back, the memory wasn't actually faulty. But there are very few motherboards that can actually handle the memory bandwidth required to support four sticks of 3600 megahertz RAM. And this motherboard was not one of them. Potentially it could, but it would require a BIOS update. And I suspect I've probably already lost at least half of you. <laughs> Suffice to say uh, that the solution to this problem was going into the BIOS and just downclocking the memory to 3200 megahertz, which is still plenty fast, but, well, it's not the 3600 that the memory is rated for, but at that kind of memory speed, the motherboard could handle it. So, fantastic. The backup PC was working, but what about the main PC? Because I said I sent it back to be repaired on the 19th of November. Well, I'll say this for PC specialists, they do have a very good website where you can actually track and monitor the status of any returns as well as any orders. And I have been tracking and monitoring the status of the return, and about a week ago I got sick and tired of checking the return status and seeing that it hasn't changed since I sent it back to them for repair two months ago. Not a week, not two weeks, not three weeks, two months. And they haven't even opened the box that I sent it back to them in. So I sent them a very angry email. It took them three days to respond to that. Normally, I have nothing but praise for PC specialists. As uh, system integrators go, they're usually one of the best, but I'm finding it increasingly difficult to recommend their returns process. Two months, I've only had this PC four months. Half of that time, it's been sitting in a warehouse, waiting for somebody to open the box and look at it. Luckily, the backup PC, the one that I got from Novatech, once I've figured out how to properly install and configure the memory, okay, has been working okay. just fine. But can you imagine if I hadn't had the money to buy another PC so quickly after buying another PC? Did you think it over? Two months. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> well, you wouldn't have to imagine it. You'd know what it would be like because you wouldn't have had a video from me for the last two months. <sighs> on the bright side, while it has been an expensive couple of months for me as far as PC hardware is concerned, I should be able to write off um, those purchases against tax as business expenses. Because they're business expenses. I could understand if it was the graphics card or the CPU that had failed. Because trying to get a hold of a GPU or a CPU these days, current generation GPUs and CPUs, is still next to impossible. But it's a cooler. <laughs> Two months to replace a cooler. Holy shit. So yeah, PC specialist. Not in my good books lately. Anyway, while we're on the subject of things that are pissing people off, don't worry, not cyberpunk. Well, not yet. <laughs> don't worry, that's coming. Oh my god, that's coming. Um, World of Tanks console. Or... Oh. Are they calling it World of Tanks Mercenaries now? I'm not entirely sure. I don't play it. Uh, I have an account because it's free to play. It was one of the first things that I installed a couple of years back when I got my PlayStation 4 Pro. Um, but I don't really play it. A lot of people do though. And they all seem to be very upset. Now, I'm sure everybody's used to the internet losing their minds whenever a developer makes a change to somebody's favourite game. And people don't like it. Often, it's usually just a complete overreaction by a vocal minority. I can think of one example, although if I stopped to think for a little bit longer, I could probably think of more, but when they introduced the radio location finding skill into World of Warships, and many people, myself included, proclaimed that this was a terrible idea. It was going to completely ruin end-game gameplay in World of Warships, when, for example, there was one ship left alive on the enemy team, badly damaged but ahead on points, and this one new skill that points in the direction of that ship would completely eliminate that ship's ability to still somehow be able to carry the game by just remaining undetected and hiding. As it happens, of course, it was all a storm in a teacup, the introduction of the RPF skill, 
absolutely did not ruin World of Warships gameplay. And in fact, you could argue that it introduced new tactical options as a direct result of the implementation of this skill uh, that, generally speaking, the player base have embraced and adapted to. But then you get other changes made to the games that we love that it's harder to reconcile and adapt to, and which you could make a convincing case for the argument that they absolutely produce more harm than good. Just to pick one example out of my arse, the aircraft carrier rework in World of Warships. The aircraft carrier rework is a good example of a change to one class of ships that actually has ramifications that extend beyond just that one class of ships, but it is still just one change. I mean, it changes the way the game works for everybody where there's an aircraft carrier in a match, but it is just the one change. Over on World of Tanks console, if they just had to put up with one change to the way that game works, uh, they would probably still have had a lot to complain about, but it would have still just been only one change. As it happens, when World of Tanks console players logged into the game on December the 14th, a lot of them could have been forgiven for thinking they were playing a completely new game. And they weren't particularly happy about it. Now, as I said, I don't actually have a horse in this race. I don't play World of Tanks console. Uh, that also means I don't really have a frame of reference to compare what the game is like after the 14th of December update and what it was like before the 14th of December update. So I'm simply going to read some of the posts that were made on Reddit about it. I do hope you're strapped in for this because it's going to get emotional. And I quote, So, now I have tanks that gain 400,000 convertible XP because according to the game, my extra crew XP on my best crews was converted to convertible XP. Because, and this is me by the way, not Reddit, they changed the way the crew system works. It's one of the many things that they changed. Anyway, back to the quote. I now have 17 million convertible XP when I had about 6 million before. The conversion rate being 25 free XP per 1 gold means I'd have to spend 680,000 gold to convert all of it. But since they turned my excess crew XP to convertible, I gained 11 million extra convertible XP. That would cost me 440,000 gold to convert. That's $1,760 I'd have to spend to get something back from my old crew experience. This is incredibly scummy wargaming. Thanks, I'm not giving them another dollar. Another post. The battle heads-up display is the worst thing ever. You can't figure out which module is damaged. You can't understand who hit you. You can't see the icons or names of the tanks unless you point directly at them. It's just a huge pile of shit. I literally can't see the game, said another user. The map is too small, half my team are grey, ammunition and consumables are all identical looking and impossible to differentiate. Colourblind mode is now the default, and turning the option on, keeps friendlies blue, makes the enemy grey. Blue is my problem colour for fuck's sakes. Give me back red green, I can't tell who shot me, where they shot me, or even if my gun's locked on. I can't see my reload while I'm aiming down the gun sight. My super crews have been purged, the interface to simply pick a crew no longer exists and requires going into another page to laboriously move them to a tank. The perks are all white again, so visually identical. I can hop in a tank without a crew. Why is that even an option? <laughs> the premium tech tree is just doldrums to get lost in instead of easily finding what you want. The garage isn't a garage, it's just purgatory. Instead of returning the hangar we've been begging for for years, the garage heads-up display is too intrusive and oversized. You can't zoom out on tanks. The bumper options at the top are so grey they've come invisible at a certain angle. You can't look at or rotate your tank when equipping camos. The upgrades tab in tank customization. What even is that? Challenge complete? Okay, cool. What challenge? <laughs> I just wanted high-res maps and tanks, not this fucking mess. Who asked for this? Another comment. What in the actual fuck happened to the battle heads up display? I feel so information starved. How much high explosive anti tank ammo do I have at the moment? Gonna have to swap to find out. What tank is that around the corner? Good luck finding out. You'll only get an outline when you have line of sight. How much health does he have? Gotta look in the lower right corner now. You'll only have an approximation above his tank. Is it a medium tank? A heavy? A tank destroyer? Nope. It's all and none at the same time. 
because until you look at it, it's just a chevron. Did I hit? Did I penetrate? Did I track? Dunno. Some white text flashed at the bottom of the screen, blended too well into the background, and then disappeared. I know I got 9 XP though, for something. Something just killed a friendly? Time to check the kill feed, and wait, the kill feed doesn't report what vehicles were involved anymore. Well, shit. The battle's been going on for a while now. Let's check how much damage I've done, dealt, or assisted. Wait, where is that info? Oh, right. The one major improvement they've made to the heads-up display since I can remember is now gone! Awesome. Good lord, this is terrible. How are you supposed to plan engagements? How are you supposed to prepare for a spotted enemy tank when nothing on the HUD will give you a hint of what they are, other than the minimap, fair enough, or how much health they're at? Uh, this goes on for quite a few pages. <laughs> um, I, I'm at a loss as to explain how they managed to fuck this up as badly as they have. I mean, it, the carrier rework in World of Warships is deeply unpopular, but it's just one thing. <laughs> It's almost as if the World of Tanks console developers saw how unpopular the aircraft carrier rework was in World of Warships and said, hold my beer! <laughs> Anything you guys can do, we can do better. Uh, like I said, I, I don't have a horse in this race. I do not play World of Tanks console. Based on the results of this update, I'm certainly not in any rush to either. So, yeah, if you do play World of Tanks console... Um, let us know what you think and how you're getting along in the comments. That's what they're for, after all. You know where they are. But while we're still on the subject of people getting upset about problems with their favourite games, it's time to talk about Cyberpunk 2077. And I'm not this time talking... About, I mean, the bugs in the game are well known. The fact that it just doesn't run at all, or if it does, it runs like an absolute three-legged dog on PlayStation 4 or Xbox One is well known. The fact that it's been pulled from the PlayStation Store and everybody's been given refunds is well known. I'm not even talking about the extreme likelihood, in fact it's all but accepted as a fact, that CDPR deliberately withheld footage of how the game was going to play on previous generation consoles in order to deceive the game's buying public. What I'm talking about today is something that's only just been revealed this week and it's to do with another deception that CDPR have inflicted upon us with regards to Cyberpunk 2077 for the best part of the last two years. It was in 2018 when I first became aware that Cyberpunk 2077 was even a thing. I know that probably sounds hard to believe but it is actually true. It was when, I think it was at the E3 show in 2018, that CDPR released a 48 minute long gameplay trailer and it's fair to say it took the world by storm. It was breathtaking. Since then people have gotten quite upset about that gameplay trailer because it featured gameplay elements that ended up being cut from the final game. But even that's not what I'm talking about today. I mean things get cut from games during development. It's not good but it happens. It's something that we should expect. No, what I'm talking about today is the fact that that gameplay trailer wasn't actually a gameplay trailer. It was a very carefully constructed lie. Do you remember just before the release of Assassin's Creed Valhalla when Ubisoft published a gameplay trailer that didn't actually contain any gameplay? <laughs> and we all had a good laugh about it. Even though it's quite disturbing that somebody who makes and publishes games for a living doesn't actually know the difference between a gameplay and pre-recorded cinematics. But it was fairly obvious that we weren't looking at gameplay and we were actually looking at pre-recorded cinematics. The thing is, what happened with CDPR's 48-minute gameplay trailer in 2018 was that it did look like actual gameplay. And as far as CD Projekt Red's executives were concerned, that was exactly the point. That was the lie that we were in fact being sold. It was not gameplay. It just looked like gameplay. What it was, was effectively pre-rendered cutscenes, except they were made and stitched together and scripted using the game engine. The game itself wasn't even vaguely playable in 2018, but those of us who watched this so-called gameplay trailer 
couldn't possibly have known that. That was the whole point of the fake gameplay trailer, and it's been revealed in an article on Bloomberg by gaming journalist Jason Schreier that that is exactly what took place as a result of interviews that he conducted with 20 anonymous, because they want to keep their jobs, CD Projekt Red developers. And it's important here, by the way, I think, that we do make a distinction between CD Projekt Red's developers and CD Projekt Red's executives, because CD Projekt Red's developers are just as pissed off about Cyberpunk 2077 as we are. Quoting from the Bloomberg article here, Interviews with more than 20 current and former CD Projekt staff, most of whom requested anonymity so as not to risk their careers, depict a development process marred by unchecked ambition, poor planning and technical shortcomings. Employees discussing the game's creation for the first time described a company that focused on marketing at the expense of development and an unrealistic timeline that pressured some into working extensive overtime long before the final push. CD Projekt declined to comment on the process or provide interviews for the story. Cyberpunk was an ambitious project by any standard. CD Projekt's previous success, The Witcher, was set in a medieval fantasy world full of swords and spells, but everything in Cyberpunk was a departure from that framework. Cyberpunk was sci-fi rather than fantasy, and instead of a third-person camera in which the player's character appeared on screen, Cyberpunk used a first-person view. Making Cyberpunk would require CD Projekt to invest in new technology, new staff and new techniques they hadn't explored before. Another indication of how CD Projekt stretched things too far was that it tried to develop the engine technology behind the game, most of which was brand new, simultaneously with the game, which slowed down production. One member of the team compared the process to trying to drive a train while the tracks are being laid in front of you at the same time. It might have gone more smoothly if the track layers had had a few months head start. A former audio programmer for CD Projekt said one of his colleagues asked during a meeting how the company thought it would be able to pull off a technically more challenging project in the same time frame as The Witcher. Someone answered, we'll figure it out along the way. Much of CDPR's focus, according to several people who worked on Cyberpunk 2077, was on impressing the outside world. A slice of gameplay was showcased at E3, the industry's main trade event, in 2018. Uh, this is the 48-minute gameplay trailer that we were talking about. It showed the main character embarking on a mission, giving players a grand tour of the seedy, crime-ridden Night City. Fans and journalists were wowed by Cyberpunk's ambition and scale. What they didn't know was that the demo was almost entirely fake. CD Projekt hadn't yet finalised and coded the underlying gameplay systems, which is why so many features, such as car ambushes, were missing from the final product. Developers said they felt like the demo was a waste of months that should have gone toward making the actual game. Employees were working long hours, even though Ivinsky told staff that overtime wouldn't be mandatory on Cyberpunk. More than a dozen workers said they felt pressured to put in extra hours by their managers or co-workers anyway. There were times when I would crunch up to 13 hours a day, a little bit over that was my record probably, and I'd do five days a week working like that, said the former audio programmer, adding that he quit the company after getting married. I have some friends who lost their families because of these sort of shenanigans, he said. And the overtime didn't make the game any faster. At E3 in June 2019, CD Projekt announced that the game would come out on April 16th, 2020. Fans were elated, but internally some members of the team could only scratch their heads, wondering how they could possibly finish the game by then. One person said they thought the date was a joke. Based on the team's progress, they expected the game to be ready in 2022. Developers began creating memes about the game getting delayed, making bets on when it would happen. Cancelling features and scaling down the size of Cyberpunk's Metropolis helped, but as the timeline started to look increasingly unrealistic, management said that delaying was not an option. Their goal was to release Cyberpunk 2077 before the new consoles from Microsoft and Sony were even announced. But by the end of 2019, management finally acknowledged that Cyberpunk needed to be delayed. Last January, the company pushed the game's release to September. In March, as the pandemic began ravaging the globe and forcing people to stay inside, CDPR staff had to complete the game from their homes. Without access to the office's console development kits, most developers would play builds of the game on their home PCs. So it wasn't clear to everyone how Cyberpunk might run on PS4 and Xbox One. External tests, however, showed clear performance issues. As the launch date drew closer, everyone at the studio knew the game was in rough shape and needed more time, according to several people familiar with the development. Chunks of dialogue were missing, some actions didn't work properly. 
When management announced in October that the game had gone gold, that it was ready to be pressed onto discs, there were still major bugs being discovered. The game was delayed another three weeks as exhausted programmers scrambled to fix as much as they could. When it finally launched on December 10th, the backlash was swift and furious. Players shared videos of screens overrun with tiny trees or characters gallivanting around without pants and compiled lists of features that had been promised but were not in the final product. The whole article paints a fairly depressing picture, although we probably shouldn't really be surprised at this point, of overworked developers desperately struggling to try to get a product out in playable form against completely unrealistic deadlines hampered by executive mismanagement. And the sad thing for me here is that when you play Cyberpunk, assuming of course that you, you know, you're playing it on a halfway decent PC so you can actually play Cyberpunk, you can plainly see just how amazing this game should have been. Parts of it are absolutely breathtaking. I mean, Night City itself is just astonishingly good. When you're walking or driving around the various different neighbourhoods in Night City and around the Badlands around Night City, the sheer amount of work and talent that's gone into creating the environment in which the game takes place is nothing short of unbelievable. The story in the game is complex, engaging, superbly well written. The characters are memorable, well acted, extremely well animated, except for when they're not. <laughs> and it's here where you can kind of... Oh, how can I put this? There are points where you're going to be engaging with some of the characters when the animations start to bug out. And this is the sort of thing I think that hurts cyberpunk more than anything else. I mean, I've come across in the process of my various different playthroughs, I think three, possibly four, uh, game-breaking bugs that make it necessary to reload an earlier save and basically try again. Now that's obviously not good and it's something that should have been ironed out before release, but it's not as bad in my opinion as some of the immersion breaking bugs because when you're as invested in the story and the characters as much as you should be when playing a game like this, when something life shattering and tragic has just happened to one of the characters that you've grown to care about and in the middle of the conversation, suddenly their pants start animating themselves. <laughs> it's just... It kind of takes away from the moment. And that's a big problem in a role-playing game, where you're supposed to be able to engage with the characters and the plot and the story. And much as I love the game, I have to confess, it is littered with these kind of immersion-breaking bugs. And it's such a shame, because you can clearly see the love that has been lavished on this game by those poor, overworked and horribly mismanaged game developers at CD Projekt Red. You can clearly see how great this game should have been and probably will be six months down the line once most of the major bugs have been worked out. But at the moment, it's a mess. It's a glorious mess in an astonishingly detailed environment uh, with an engaging story and characters that you're going to love and hate. But it is a mess. And it's a mess that it turns out CDPR's executives have been basically lying to us about for the best part of the last two years since they released a gameplay trailer at E3 2018 that didn't actually have any gameplay in it whatsoever but was instead a very carefully constructed and scripted tissue of lies. I guess the lesson here is, stop pre-ordering games. Wait until they've been released, read the reviews, then decide whether or not you want to spend your money on it. You don't really lose anything by not pre-ordering. I mean, it's not like they're going to run out of stock. It's a digital product. It's ones and zeros. They're not going to run out of ones and zeros. Wait for the game to be released, read the reviews, then decide whether or not you want to spend money on it. I mean, I would have bought the game anyway, and I haven't regretted playing it. In the 320.2 hours, yes, really, that I have so far invested in playing Cyberpunk 2077, I can't say I've regretted any of it.
it has been amazing but you can clearly see just how much more amazing Nobody it really that. should have been still no regrets and finally in other news it turns out that Disney have ended or are going to end the exclusivity deal that they have with Electronic Arts as far as Star Wars games are concerned I have to admit Electronic Arts haven't done too badly for Star Wars games in the last couple of years Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order was actually pretty damn good it didn't have a predatory business model you basically bought the game played it and that was it Star Wars Squadrons wasn't bad at all it was a less ambitious project but again you bought the game you played it and you got exactly what you paid for unfortunately two decent games in the best part of 10 years is a pretty shitty track record so I greeted the news that Disney was ending their exclusive contract with Electronic Arts with great delight and then I saw that the first company that will be developing a new Star Wars game was Ubisoft and because that's just all that Ubisoft knows how to do it will of course be an open world game now while it's almost certainly far too early for Ubisoft to announce that they're starting to take pre-orders for whatever open world Star Wars game they squat out I have absolutely no doubt based on past performance that within oh, I don't know a year at the most you will already be able to place pre-orders for the standard deluxe gold platinum or excelsior versions of Far Creed 8 Tatooine Wildlands <laughs> available on Steam good old games the Epic Game Store but probably exclusive to Ubisoft Connect for at least the first year of release and on that probably very depressing bombshell that's it for this week's episode of Mingles with Jingles I do hope you've enjoyed it I hope you've all had a good weekend I hope you're all gonna have a great week and I hope I've given you something to talk about in the comments because that is it and as always take care stay safe and I'll catch you next time <laughs>